Martin uh, and oh, excellent. So that's been recorded then, so we don't have to remind anyone. Okay, so yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, um, Barry is going to he's going to explain sort of uh, where he's from and uh, and and sort of uh, how he ended up in Peru. But um, I kind of. Uh, got to hear about Barry because uh, when, when I actually got married in April 1998, uh, being the romantic sort, I took my wife to Beidahe in China um, because obviously I knew that she wanted to see um, uh, Siberian ruby throats and Siberian blue robins and things like that. Um, but while we were in China, there was an American lady on the trip and she was constantly going on about this place. Uh, called Manu in Peru um, and it's, it really did sound like the promised land it was a land of mannequins tanagers hoetzin and hummingbirds um, and it was this rainforest reserve in the middle of Peru um, and I suppose one of the things that's so special about it is it's got sort of rainforest at all elevations going high up into the Andes and, and lots of lowland rainforest as well um, so when we went there, uh, we ended up um, in October 2000. Uh, we went over there with uh, Wings uh, via uh, Sunbird, um, you know, one of the British company, but using the American agents. And um, the ground agents that Wings used was Manu Expeditions, and uh, and the ground agent uh, and guide was Barry Walker, uh, our tonight's speaker. Now, bear in mind that. I've been a bit of a dirty twitcher this year, nothing huge, but I've, I've travelled around a bit, just around the UK and seen about 255 species in a year, which is not a humongous amount. But you think about in Britain, in almost a year, it's December now, 255 species. When I went to Peru with Barry, we were there for two weeks and we had almost 600 species. So I was probably only about 26 at the time. So it was the first time I'd been to mainland South America. I'd been to... Trinidad and Tobago one. So I think my, my head almost exploded because like you go into the rainforest and get a feeding flock and, you know, there could be like 20 to 30 new species in it. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, so um, Barry, um, he showed us about 600 species in two weeks. Uh, he showed us his rainforest. Um, he showed us Machu Picchu. Um, he showed us his pub, the Cross Keys in Square in Cusco in Peru and uh, his own um Pisco Sour, the local uh, um, liqueur that was very nice. And ironically, Barry, I still have some here. So I need to ask <laughs> you for your uh, your secret recipe uh, so I can get some ready for, for Christmas. Um, so Barry, he, he ran uh, a, a, an expeditions company, Mano Expeditions. He, he's the, he was the honorary, probably still is the honorary British consulate in Cusco. And he also took Michael Palin, um, uh, around Peru when he went full circle. So uh, here we have Barry Walker. Uh, he's going to tell us how he ended up in Peru uh, and what he's been doing and what birds he's been seeing over the last 40 years. So thank you very much for talking to us tonight, Barry, and over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Steve. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. And, uh, you know, sometimes you miss the old country and it's nice to be... Uh, connected with the UK, even if it's only for a few minutes, and by, uh, by Zoom, which during the pandemic has become uh, the mode, modus operandi of uh, staying in touch with people. But enough about that. What about me? Uh, I think you can see the photo up on the screen there. Um, I live in the Andes. Um, that's not the Andes. Uh, that's the Pennines just outside Staley Bridge, which is where I grew up. And uh, I Staley Bridge, if you don't know where it is, is about seven miles. Uh, outside of Manchester on the edge of the Pennines. And I grew up at the age 11, 15, something like that. Um, uh, I saw a chaffinch. I didn't know what it was. I told my mum. She bought me the Observer's Book of Birds. I identified as a chaffinch. Uh, there was no stopping me. I wanted to see other birds. It was red grouse. It was wind chats. It was night jars at night. I volunteered at a local RSPB reserve, joined the Manchester Ornithological Society, went on a coach trip to South Shields to twitch a adult ivory gull, uh, which became my first UK twitch. And during the 70s, I was, there was no stopping me. I was twitcher and went for every rare bird in the UK that turned up and it's still in my DNA. But um, life moves on. I went to Hull University, 
local patches were Flamborough Head, uh, particularly Sperm Point, where I was not really in the good books of the, uh, the warden there. But at some point I decided to move to the Shetlands uh, because they were just getting the oil out of the North Sea and there was big money to be had working on the rigs in the North Sea. And I wanted to get some money uh, after my university degree to go world birding. And um, there you go. I uh, then uh, went out on holiday. Now I was supposed to go to Thailand, but the flights were booked up. So I ended up in a place called Peru, which as far as I know, was somewhere south of Mexico. Uh, my friend had organized a tour and I ended up uh, in Peru. And this is where I live. This is not the Pennines. This is the Andes. And way down in the valley there, you can see the little village I live in, uh, which is my, it's uh, about an hour's drive from the tourist city of Cusco and not far from the famous ruins of Machu Picchu. And that's where I live right now. That's my house, uh, my garden, that's my corn crop, because I, uh, I do grow maize in, in the land at the back of the house. So that's how, uh, but how did I get here? How did I get here, uh, you know, living in this house at 3,000 meters in the Andes, outside Cusco, growing corn, leading bird tours, running a bird tour company, and all this kind of stuff. Well, I came out on this holiday in, 1980 uh, and um, the plane came through Miami and it went to the jungle town of Iquitos. And the first morning we got whisked up river, there was no time for birding or anything. And it was dark when we got to the lodge. And the next morning we got up at dawn and I walked into the Amazon rainforest for the first time in my life. And I could not, it was like a cathedral. It was, it was an, it was a, a, an esoteric experience. The dawn chorus was unbelievable. There was several dozens of birds calling. I had no idea. These majestic trees, cathedral-like environment, primates, yellow-handed titi monkeys, and so on, um, moving through the trees. It was, you know, it was an epiphany, really. And um, I'd never seen anything like it, never imagined even having seen some TV shows that, uh, that a place like this exists. So I started, my first start in Peru was in the Amazon. That's what I looked like in those days. That's actually tropical savanna, um, which is very rare in Peru. It's only one very remote corner on the Bolivian border. And it's a sort of major expedition to get there. But because twitching's in my DNA, and birding's in my DNA. I do also research, but I'm also in my heart a twitcher as I was in the, in the 70s in the UK. I had to go there to get a dozen species that occur nowhere else in Peru. Uh, so that was me then, that's me now. Uh, it's pretty frightening really to see what, uh, as time marches on, what it does to you. I have, you may notice I have changed my bins and you may notice I have put on a little more weight. But uh, that's up in Iquitos, near where I uh, first entered the country. Um, I was about, oh, 28 years old when I started living in Peru. I started to live in Peru not as a, a um, conscious decision, um, I decided to go back to UK, get a grub stake, come out, do as much burning as I could in Peru, including the Andes. I'm a hero, back to the UK, get a proper job, use my degree, find a wife, have kids, get a mortgage, and do all the usual stuff. Well, it never happened because during the, um, well, I'll come on to that in a minute, but I want to show you first a bit about Peru in, uh, and, um, you know, how it is. It's five times bigger than the United Kingdom. So it's a lot of territory to cover. Much of it is really inaccessible. I've done trips that have taken light planes to jungle airstrips, and then it's like 
two days walk with a native guide hacking through the jungle just to get to see one bird or you know hike for five days up a mountain to see a newly discovered barbet which then to my annoyance several years later was found at the end of a road where you could drive to um things like that it's an exciting country peru as you can see is bordered by ecuador colombia brazil bolivia and chile at the moment because of the pandemic the only land borders that are open are ecuador and chile the rest are closed um if you look on the uh, this is a north south orientation map so if you look on the east side the light green with those blue lines uh, that is the amazon rainforest and those blue lines are the major rivers uh, the one in the top right hand corner that flows into brazil the amazon uh, which is by the congress of tours in peru um the dark green to the left of it is the Andes and down in the south you can see a little figure of a plane and a town called that's where I'm talking to you from right now or very close to it and on the coast you can see a, a lighter colored strip uh, which has the capital Lima and that is the arid littoral it is basically in the rain shadow of the Andes uh, the weather movements come from east to west here, not like where you are from west to east. And the Andes causes rain shadow. And Lima is in the Atacama Desert, which is one of the driest deserts in the world. So we have this great contrast between rainforest, high Andes, uh, and, and arid desert, which is why it has such high biodiversity and everything not just birds um it has like a second or third highest bird list in the world um but it's butterflies it's uh, primates it's all kinds of things. diversity is unbelievable i personally have seen 1775 species of birds in peru but i've made an effort and i've had the the luck to be able to join several university expeditions into really remote areas where it'd be very difficult to get to without having um, you know backup of a university specifically specifically louisiana state university from the united states um if you compare it as well peru being five times bigger than the uk but it's only got 38 million people when i first came here in 1982 it had 30 million people so you can you can see how the population is growing rapidly so when you go into the amazon it looks like that and it's pretty some parts of it are pretty impressive to the casual observer when you walk into the Amazon, it looks pretty much the same. Oh, here's the, there are several micro habitats in the Amazon, such as terra firma forest, vagia forest, and micro habitats, which are very important if you're chasing some special birds, such as guadua bamboo patches, or cecropia thickets, or oxbow lakes formed by the meandering rivers. And birding in the Amazon can be a bit of a challenge. It's hot, it's sticky, it's got insects, but if you go to the right places, uh, Steve mentioned, which is a great place, trails, continents, and you can be on those trails and you see these people are a large species of bamboo called guadua. So what we, as a, I as a tour leader used to call bamboo patrol, which was dreaded by all my clients because it's the most and he did, and where to be. But if you want to get those special birds, you had to go there. And some of the birds you can see in the Amazon are pretty spectacular. I mean, there's lots of drab fly catchers and other things, but many of the birds are quite spectacular. Um, it's a specialized army ant follower. So you can walk, wander around the Amazon rainforest for days and days and days and never see or hear this bird until you find an army ant swarm. And once you find a swarm of army ants, this bird is an obligatory army ant follower and um, pretty special bird to see. 
uh, um, he's kind of the army ant leader. He makes a call that other army ant birds know, and they flip between army ant swarms and uh, follow him, really. He's got an equivalent in the south. And another, you know, there's lots of special birds to see in the Amazon. Uh, many people who came on my trips and many people who come to the Amazon, one of the birds they want to see is a trumpeter. And this is a pale winged trumpeter. And, um, you know, they're, uh, they've been extirpated in many places. So you have, really have to go to fairly remote places or protected areas to see them. They move around in, uh, in large groups. I actually went to play a call to you um, to, see, to show you how, like, these are really kind of special. I hope you can hear this. Come on. No, no, I can't hear it. It's not working. Sorry about that. I wanted you to really hear this. Oh, there we go. So there you go, a bit different from a chiff chaff. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the forest is, is full of sounds like that. And you have spectacles such as macaulics, uh, where parrots and macaws uh, come down to eat clay, like we would take kale in to settle our stomach after eating something uh, that's been a bit toxic. Because at certain times of the year, especially in the dry season, the forest doesn't produce many fruits, which these birds feed on. And the fruits it does produce have mild toxins. They, they, they've evolved to have toxins to stop predators eating them, unlike some summer of fruiting plants and trees, which actually make themselves very tasty so that they can, uh, that birds can eat them and, and disperse them uh, in their seeds throughout the forest. So the Amazon is an absolutely wonderful place to be, but, the Amazon is really hot and it's really humid. It's got things like hairy crested ant birds, which is a big prize. Uh, many people want to see that. God, I've been here for a long time and I can count on my hands the number of times I've seen that bird. And it's a very special bird indeed. But the Amazon is hot and humid. And to live there personally, personally for me, having grown up in Manchester, it's just unbearable, especially in the summer, which is right now. And uh, you have to get into some cooler environment sooner or later. So what I decided to do was to go to Cusco. This is a town where I live. This is the main square. And I went to Cusco because to get out of the Amazon, it's, it's high up in the Andes, it's dry, crisp, mountain air. And it was, it's also a tourist center, so I could meet other foreigners and other English people, get a break, clean expeditions down into the rainforest. But moving up into the Andes in those days had its problems. Up in the Andes, you can, there was, during the 1980s, a subversive group called the Shining Path Gorillas. This then I spent much of my time dodging their bullets or presents. Uh, they were heavily dominated by women. The women's lot in the Andes is not a wonderful one. It's a very uh, unequal society amongst peasant communities where women are downtrodden and abused. And many of them stood up and said, we'll put a gun and and uh, ready to fight. But the people, nasty people, they were killers. They were not like the friendly FARC in Colombia. These guys didn't take prisoners, didn't ask for ransom. Any foreigner, they just killed you. And so I spent a lot of my time uh, dodging these people, had some close escapes with them. Uh, one night at uh, one place, we got mistaken for, actually for terrorists by the local security forces. And our camp was attacked at night 
And before they could fire the first bullet, I managed to convince them that we were, we were friendly, gave them our passports and so on. And in return, they gave me a, a memo, uh, a sort of memory, which I still have, uh, some ordnance from, uh, from their guns, which I still keep as a, <laughs> as a token of my surviving one of my 11 birding lives. Um, they killed two British birders at a place in Peru um, in 1990, and that effectively killed all kinds of bird tourism, nature tourism um, to Peru for effectively 10 years, uh, during which time I was the only bird watcher in Peru. Actually, the one was a, a, a Swedish friend of mine who lives in Lima, but just can you imagine that whole country, five times the size of the UK, with just two bird watchers? Um, we had it all to ourselves. And though I'm not a biologist, I grew up as a birder. I, uh, I learned ornithology and became a sort of peripheral part of the ornithological community uh, because of my self-learning. And so during those 10 years when there were no birders coming, I thought, well, what can I do here? So I threw my binoculars in, the, in, in my backpack and went off and started looking for lost Inca ruins. And uh, this one, which is called Chucky Curao, was actually known, but no one had visited it for like, you know, uh, 80 years. Uh, the, the photo uh, um, on the left is uh, been cleared by the, the archaeological authorities. Um, but when I was there, it was all covered in, in cloud forest. And those um, terraces on the right with the, um, the Yamas, uh, the pictures, uh, sort of drawings on them. I, did, I missed them. I couldn't even see them. They were covered, covered in cloud forest. So that's how I filled in my time. But my binoculars were always in the bottom of my pack. I'd hear something new. Um, I was carrying around this huge, heavy Sony 5000 recorder and microphone. And if I heard anything unusual or saw anything unusual, I'd whip those out and uh, go and bird and see it. But it was 10 years before, really, um, you could do that. And wandering around Peru, even today, this was an Inca ruin I bumped into uh, about two years ago. It's actually a pre-Inca ruin. Um, it, I was just birding and I just saw this sort of hillside and I thought, wow, there's some ruins up there. So I made a detour, went up there, and here's this major ruin of Sondor, which I'd never even heard of. And this has happened many times. And some of them are not even registered in the registry of the, the archaeological community. But getting back to the Andes and getting away from the, uh, the bad old days, here's the good old days. Now, this is a famous bird watching spot in the Andes called Mark Pomacocha. It's at, uh, let's see, uh, 4,600 meters. Uh, God knows what that is in feet. I might have it written down here, actually. Um, uh, no, I don't. But uh, anyway, you can get the idea. It's really, really high. And to bird at those altitudes, I've taken many people up there, tried to stage in a long way, but there's not enough time like when you're climbing a mountain, uh, like mountain climbers do to climb Everest or whatever, to have camps and acclimatize on the way up. We've got like at the most one night at middle altitude to acclimatize. And then we've got and many people get sick, uh, well, there is a drug called Diamops that can prevent that. But this is Marco Pomacocha. And the reason we go there is because it's got some really special birds and so does the Andes. I mean, you come out of the rainforest, which is the lowest part on the east, and you come up to the middle part, which is the highest point in the middle. And you get special birds like that, which is the endemic white-bellied Synclodes. Uh, Synclodes are members of the Fernerid family, uh, which is a large family here in Peru. Compared to the UK, we have way more passerine birds than we do non-passerine birds. I can remember birding in the UK and it was all gulls and terns and waders and so on and so forth. If you, you put me on a rubbish tip and I tried to sort out the, uh, uh, the immature gulls these days, I'd be lost in space. But uh, in Peru, um, non-passerine birds are, uh, are far fewer than passerine birds, and some of them are pretty spectacular. There are 
many species of Synclodes, and as I say, they're a member of the ovenbird or fernerid family. And then, you know, up at high altitude here, a special people go to look for, and it's a crowd pleaser. And because a lot of people are into waders, onto it is this. Uh, this is the diadem sandpiper plover that only lives at altitudes of 4,000 meters in Peru. But if you move further south to Argentina and Chile, you can get it at some places at lower altitudes as you move south to go. But here it's uh, it, uh, huff and puff. Fortunately, the, uh, the road to the sites I have uh, goes within a couple of hundred meters of where the birds are. Um, but in, even though it's only a slight descent to where the birds are in a bog, they live in heat box up in the Andes. It's, uh, well, you can see people really struggling that 200, you know, 300 feet back up to the car, uh, up to the bus, really huffing and puffing and some people needing some help uh, so birding is, is fantastic the scenery is fantastic but you've got to be prepared for it and uh, I was just saying uh, uh, to Steve earlier that um, in the Andes you know we're all suffering climate change and Peru is one of the most affected countries in the world on climate change I have photos of snow peaks blue ice glaciers from 19 and I have photos of that same mountain from a few years ago and there's no snow there's no ice it's just black rock the glaciers are repeat, retreating here at such a tremendous rate um, that it's causing water shortages uh, uh, amongst campesino communities that depend on irrigation and causing conflict between communities so it does have its social as well, but we're on about birds. And here's the king of the uh, of the Andes, the Andean condor. Uh, I was just looking for its its friend, the Californian condor in California recently, and missed it. So, uh, but anyway, they're all re-released birds. But this is the Andean condor, and it's not uncommon. Um, it's not in any real danger. It's got a good population. If you go to its dormitories and wait, as the day warms up and the thermals come up. You can, uh, you can see eight, ten soaring out of the canyons and coming close enough that the, the wind from their wings will knock your hat off. It's quite an incredible sight for these carrion-eating birds. But when you're on the top of the Andes, you can go west or you can go east. If you go east, you slide off the top of the Andes and down into the Amazon forest. But before you get to the Amazon rainforest, you've got to transfer the cloud forest. Jungus, as it's called in the local language. And that hosts a whole gamut of birds that are not in the Amazon and are not in the Andes. And the cloud forest starts at, with Elfin Forest around about 3,300 meters and goes down to about 800 meters before you can really say you're getting into the Amazon. So 100, and every couple of hundred meters you drop, you're in the same forest, but the bird community is different. So you've got mixed flocks with different members uh, around you. And one of the great places to do this is to find a road that transects from the high Andes down to the Amazon. Uh, unfortunately, where you have a road, it brings in colonists and it brings in um, rainforest destruction. And the Manu Road uh, is one of the best, which is in my part of the world in southeastern Peru. It leaves from the tourist town of Cusco and goes down into the Amazon. And then you can go to the jungle town of Puerto Maldonado and fly out. And there are many lodges along the way where you can stay. It's a great trip, although right now, they're starting to better the, better the road and, uh, and pave it. So how that will affect the bird life and watching from the road, because the terrain, as you can see, is so steep uh, that unless you're on a road, 
it's almost impossible to get inside the forest, uh, apart from a few lodges that have a few trails, but it's, it's tough going. But the Meadow Road is great. The Satipo Road is great. There's some roads to the south of Cusco that are pretty new, uh, that need exploring. More roads being built, the Peruvian economy before the pandemic was growing uh, every year, which meant more money in, in, in the coffers, roads and so on and so forth, but still very much a third world country. Uh, the cloud forest is fantastic. Uh, going down that road, uh, that, that, that photo was taken actually from the Manor Road. And that tree, I took a photo of that tree because the time before I passed that tree, there was a spectacled bear sitting in that tree, uh, ripping out the hearts of the bromeliads and eating it. So while you're birding, a lot of focus on birds. While you're birding, especially on the Manor Road, you're seeing mammals and an incredible diversity of butterflies, especially at middle elevations. In fact, some companies uh, or some people I know run specialized butterfly tours uh, in that part of the world because the diversity is, is so great. And uh, Spectacle Bear, of course, Paddington Bear must have been a Spectacle Bear because he was from deepest, darkest Peru. So there you go. Um, in these forests, you can see some pretty spectacular birds and some pretty non-spectacular birds. There's lots of bristle tyrants and toady tyrants, which are, you know, nice birds. I, I like nondescript birds that, that give you a challenge to identify, but there's also these spectacular things like this gray-breasted mountain toucan, which is fairly common. And uh, you can see that fairly easily at the higher elevations. Uh, of the Andean cloud forests. And of course, this guy, uh, this is the Andean cock of the rock. There's only two cock of the rocks in the world, the Guyanan and the Andean. Uh, if you want to see the Guyanan, you've got to go to uh, Northeast Brazil or the Guyanan Shield. That is a good place to see it uh, and a good birding country. I used to lead toys there. Um, but cock of the rocks are incredible because they are, uh, they perform at leks like mannequins. Uh, a lek is a gathering place for males where um, they dance and parade themselves to try and attract females to uh, win their favors. But actually studies have shown in Cock of the Rocks, it's like these experienced males who are do the best dancers on the dance floor and do all the best dancing actually lose out because the immature males sneak in at the back and the females on the periphery and mate with the female while he's still doing his thing on the dance floor. So uh, being the best dancer is not everything to get ladies' favors. Um, you might, there's lots of other things. The phone is still there. Um, this is a montane wood creeper. These are my kind of birds. These are the kind of birds I like. Um, you know, they're tricky to identify. Once you get your eye in, you can, uh, you can sort them out especially by call. You, you really need to be on top of your game on calls if you, if you want to be a successful leader. But if you just want to go down and enjoy yourself, you need to know the calls. You'll bump into birds wherever you go. Lots of birds. Um, that's a montane wood creeper. I did say streak-headed. Sorry, that's its lowland equivalent. And then when you drop off the west side of the high Andes, you get down to the Atacama Desert in the rain shadow of the Andes. And this is moonscape. You know, you, you wouldn't be surprised to see a moon rover uh, come over a hill um, or a guy in an astronaut suit. It's, uh, it really is. There are some places, many places, where rainfall has never, ever been recorded. But it's not birdless. There are some special birds there, like the Peruvian thickney, which likes these arid conditions. What it feeds on, where it finds its insects, must be an insect feeder. But what it feeds on, uh, I haven't really worked out. I haven't checked the literature, so I should do that first. But as you can see by its very large eye, it's partially nocturnal. So I think it does a lot of its feeding at night. And what it feeds on at night, I don't think anyone knows. Um, 
But then as soon as you hit the coast, uh, I mean, this, this narrow strip is bordered by the Pacific Ocean, of course. But as soon as you hit the coast, even in the big cities, this was taken in the city of Lima, the capital city, a city of uh, 12 million people. You just, and then you've got a lovely Inca turn just sitting around waiting to be photographed. And other thing which is, uh, serves almost the whole world's population of, uh, well, the whole world's population of Franklin's Gulf winters in, uh, in Peru and Chile. They're here right now on the coast in their thousands, tens of thousands. So a trip on the coast is a great thing to do. And the good thing about it is that if you're going somewhere else in Peru, the Amazon, the Andes and the Amazon, or just the Andes, if you've got a half day uh, before your flight goes out, or a better a day before your flight go goes out, you can take a trip along the coast and see all these gulls and turns, including this one, the Inca turn, and, uh, and you know, I had a lot of good birds, and I've noticed that uh, many people from all over the world, um, after watching fly catches in the Amazon, are quite happy to see some big turns and waders as they go along. But if you're lucky enough and you can, they're not very common and they're hard to organize. If you can organize a pledge that goes maybe 20 nautical miles offshore and uh, do some chumming, you can get some very um, anywhere else in the world. Now, the top photo is a large group of uh, Wilson's storm, uh, sorry, Elliot's storm petrels. Um, which breed uh, on the islands off the coast of, of Peru. And the bigger black ones, uh, they're black storm petrels from further north. They range up uh, as far as California. Um, the bottom left-hand photo is the, the much wanted uh, ring storm petrel. Uh, I've been on pelagic with seabird experts that say that, wow, that was my last storm petrel, the last one I needed for my world list. So it really is quite restricted. We've just found that it nests in uh, saltpeter hole, crusts in saltpeter deep in the Atacama Desert. It nests in the desert, as does the probably the bottom right-hand bird, which is the uh, Markham storm petrel, which is um, nests are known, but uh, the major breeding colonies are not known. It's also pretty much a bird you've got to see in the Humboldt current. The Humboldt current being a cold water current that comes up from Antarctica, the west coast of, of South America, bringing cold water and plants, and thus all these um, strange seabirds. And you know, you go out, you can see birds from the north. There's a albatross, a waved albatross, nests on the Galapagos and only one other island off Ecuador. But it's the commonest albatross when you go. Uh, go offshore in a pelagic in, in Peru, but you know it's a mollyhawk, not a real albatross. But you can see other molly, mollyhawks uh, such as Bullers and Chatham Island and Black Browed, of course, and and others. I've seen up to five albatrosses on a pelagic trip in the austral winter, i.e., this time of uh, your uh, your summer. So I've told you about a very brief description of what's available in Peru, how I got here, the trials and tribulations of working through the terrorist years. Lucky to still be here, glad to still be here. My twitching DNA is still in me. Uh, although I've seen 1,775 species here in Peru, um, I still have the urge to see a new species in my Peru list. Some people keep a world list, some people keep a country list, uh, and I, a count list in the United States, a state list in the United States, um, a UK list. The only list that's important to me is my Peru list, and I work on it actively. And the last bird, is, and this is a bird with the strange name of Panau Ant Pitta. I drove 750 miles one way 
to go and see that. Now, it wasn't just that this bird had been blown in by some storm or other, or anything. It's lived there for thousands of years. It's ancestors anyway. And it, that species, has been living in that forest uh, all those times. It just so happened that the powers that be split birds into, into various species. And when I looked down, I thought, wow, I haven't seen that one. And it was the middle of the pandemic. I got into my pickup truck with my driver. We had a COVID test before we left and boom. 750 miles, we camped, no social contact and uh, birding is, you don't see birds, you've just got to get to where they live. The right altitude, the right habitat, the right place, which could be very difficult. Might just take four days by mule. On the other hand, we do get the odd vagrants. Vagrants are not a big thing here. But earlier this year, South America's second ever record of Mongolian plover, I think it's called lesser sand plover these days, uh, turned up and I went 570 miles for it and dipped. So there you go, bittersweet, there we go. That, but Peru, although we know most of it's 84, we're finding out new things all the time. We're finding out that one bird that looks like that you can see on screen, in fact, five species, because the one over here sings like this, the one over there sings like that, the one over there sings like that. Then you get to do a DNA sample and you realize they're very, very, very different. Um, but even spectacular escape detection, because the country is so vast, forests are so thick, this is the recently described in Titanica. Now, how the hell can you miss a bird like that? And not only that, it was on the Manu Road that I birded dozens of more times before and never seen it. Well, the answer is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's low density on the Manu Road, only in its non-breeding season, it's breeding locations are now known to be in Bolivia in a dry deciduous forest. So it's marginal there anyway. Oh, I mean, how can that be missed in Bolivia and Peru? It looks like some European, completely different from most South American birds or that, that the Cordura is an ant bird. Um, that was recently described. How can you miss that? It's nearest to Racina in Guyana. But how could you miss that? You can miss it. The reason you can miss it is it's whistling song. It only does once in a blue moon at a certain time of year. And some bird had just happened to record it on his uh, cell phone and played it back to a, an ornithologist and went, wow, that's a new bird for science. So here in Peru, we've got a lot to still find. It's a wonderful country. It has its ups and downs like all countries. We have our political issues, we have our social issues, we have our climate issues, but we've got great birds. And I hope I haven't bored you and uh, come out to Peru. It's a great place. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Barry. Barry. Brilliant. That was brilliant. Thank you. And um, I know that I imagine there'll, there'll be a few questions. I'll, I'll give Gary a moment or two to, to, to check whether we've had any sent in. But if I might um, start that process, Barry, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you, you work with Louisiana State University. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about any of the research or conservation that you're actively involved with in Peru. Uh, well, when I say I work with Louisiana Station, that's not strictly true. I was invited on some of their expeditions um, as a kindness because I'd help, help them out in previous expeditions with logistics and so on. And just because I knew these scientists who were going on the expedition and I could help out uh, recording birds and uh, just generally add to the expedition crew. Yeah. Um, so I do actively um, contribute to science. Uh, I've written uh, and co-authored several scientific and non-scientific articles. Um, I am involved in conservation. 
The tour company puts money back into conservation in a proportionate manner, but uh, mostly it's education. I do a lot of talk to university students uh, on uh, conservation, birds, uh, what great biodiversity you have here. Take your mind away from politics and the pandemic. Look at what you have. Birds are everywhere. You can go out. You don't need lots of money. You can just go out for a walk and you can do that. That kind of, it's the kind of stuff I do. Yeah. Barry. Steve, had you got any questions, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Um, just just mention it, it's quite ironic. So I know we were chatting about it earlier, but <clears throat> you go know about the, the Inti Tanager, which wasn't it nicknamed the Kill Bill Tanager? In the early days, because uh, the film Kill Bill, I think, had a yellow yellow flump with a, a black stripe, and essentially it looks a bit like a like a, a golden oriole of sorts, doesn't it? And uh, um, unfortunately, I I, I was on that trip in two thousand where you. Um, I, th I think it was D Dan Lane and Gary Rosenberg were stood behind me, and you were nearby, and literally the bird just popped up in a bush, and I think they saw it, and I think you 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 didn't see it at that point, did you? You got it later, didn't you? And um, I was just looking the other way, and they were so excited about the species, and like I, I was speaking to Gary the, the year after, and he was saying that they thought it could possibly be a new species for science and then seeing on your Facebook recently that have been dis described as the Inti Tanager and realizing that I was actually the the moment when it was seen like possibly the first time ever uh, of a new species for science and I was looking in the wrong direction it was a <laughs> it was a bit of a, a bitter pill to swallow and 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 the other thing is you put up your, the pale wing trumpeter um when I, re I remember on, on on your trip we because we were in the grid um, it's it's like lowland rainforest in 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 Manu, um, and because uh, it's so dense, everyone's walking in a line, and and they take it in turn. So if you're at the front, you're there for a few minutes, then you had to walk to the back, and and I remember what Barry did is he there was pale wing trumpeter on the path, but he, he he pointed backwards down the line to quietly whisper, pale wing trumpeter ahead, right which a lot of the members of the group were really old and they all looked backwards apart from my wife who looked forwards. She saw the trumpeters just pottering away and then gradually walk off into the forest. But at that point, I was at the back of the queue. So by the time I rugby charged myself to the front of the queue, they'd gone. So my wife's got pale wing trumpeter up on me, which is a, that's a, that's a bit of a swab, but almost 600 other species. So I would say Peru, fantastic, wonderful. Yeah, and thank you. Well, you've got to come back for the trumpeter then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can do that together. Yeah, and you get one back on your wife. Um, <laughs> it's nice. My, my wife's not seen one, so don't worry about it. Um, right. Yeah, you were talking about the Kill Bill Tanager. Well, this bird, okay, well, we were on that trip when it was discovered. Um, we were top heavy on leaders because the two main Sunbird Wings leaders were. Gary Rosenberg and Dan Lane, and they had never been down the Manor Road. So the owner, the company owner said, Barry, will you do us a favor and accompany Dan and, and Gary and make sure they don't get lost and point them in the right direction so they can learn for future tours. You know, don't let them walk off into the weeds and get lost. Okay, I'll do that. But because we were top heavy on leaders, they were up front and I realized there were some older people at the back who were struggling a bit. So I decided to stay at the back and show them some tanagers and, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, the other two leaders were at the front. And at some point I just saw Gary leaping up and down and the scope was set up pointing at something and Dan was looking at the scope. And leaping up and down, I said, get down here, get down here. So I ran down the road as fast as my creaking bones would allow. And he said, look in the scope. And I put my eye to the scope and there was a shaky branch. The bird had that just flown before I put my eye to the scope. So Dan being quite a, uh, a good artist, got out his sketchbook and made a sketch of this bird. Quite a good sketch, I've, I've still got it today. And he said, we saw that. And I said, no, you didn't. There's no bird that looks like that on this road. Yeah, he said, I think I've got a recording. I said, play it to me. And he played it. And Dan said, that sounds like a yellow throat. 
And I said, yeah, but there's no yellow throats here in the... Uh... So the mystery evolved from that. And it was unknown. It was looked for two years later. It... I had the recording, no one else did, apart from the leaders, on the next tour as they looked for it. And on a private tour, uh, uh, Gary looked for it and saw it. Uh, having amplified the sound and got a better recording. And one of the participants who was a Brit on the tour said, oh, it looks like that girl in the movie Kill Bill Tenage, you know, the one in the, uh, in the yellow jumpsuit. And so yes. for some reason, it caught on like wildfire and became known as the Kill Bill Tenage. In fact, I'm going to tell you who it was who did that. It was the author of, uh, what was it called? Uh, it was Chris Goody who did the book on seeing all the pitters in a year. Uh, anyway, it was he who coined the name and it became known colloquially as Kill Bill Tanager. But most of us in Peru called it the San Pedro Tanager because that was the nearest settlement where Coca-Cola Lodge was. And it was known as a San Pedro Tanager for quite a long time. But the describers of the bird decided to honour uh, the bird, the, the Quechua and Aymara cultures uh, who call the sun Inti because of the, it's the color of the sun. And so it beca became Inti Tanager. And it's named, of course, for its scientific name is named for John O'Neill, the person from Louisiana State University, the director who, before his retirement, sent many, many, many expeditions from Louisiana University down into Peru. He probably knows more about Peruvian birds than all the rest of us put together. And uh, that is why Louisiana State University became the major university working on Peruvian birds. Uh, but yeah, I can't do anything about your trumpeter, mate, sorry. <laughs> yes, thanks, Mary. <laughs> As Gary's indicated, if anybody has any open questions, please put them forward. You're very welcome to ask Barry uh, a question this evening before we, we have to say goodbye to him. It's a great opportunity. Now, there's, there's a couple in the chat. Um, but I'd just like to say first, actually, that your talk reminded me of something else I'd forgotten when I was in Peru. It was a trip to the Colca Canyon near Arequipa and a really early start to watch the condors actually take off and circle on the thermals. That was a pretty amazing experience as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Martin, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Uh, uh, thanks for the talk, it was a wonderful talk. I was just wondering about, um, you mentioned at one point for 10 years of just you and uh, another person who were the, um, um, the birders in the area, Swedish chap, but uh, What's the attitude of the local population to, to birding? Is it one of more supporting ecotourism or are there birders in their own right? Um, okay. Recently, let's say the last 15 years, um, because specifically in the Cusco area of Southeast Peru, which is a major tourist town and has large amounts of tour groups, pre-pandemic, of course, um, massive tourism, mainly to see the ruins of Machu Picchu, but other things as well. The guides have to be up to speed on, you know, everything. They have to be, uh, know a bit about everything. So they know a bit about the orchids, know a bit about the birds, they know a bit about this, know a bit about that. And some of them showed an interest in, in knowing more about birds. So it came to people like myself and others and said, listen, I, I want to know how, what it's like to be a bird tour leader. I want to be a bird tour leader. And some of them did it because they were really interested in birds, had been as kids, but never had the opportunity to really, to really look out uh, for birds or go birding. Uh, some of them did it, some of the professional tour leaders did it because it was lucrative. Uh, being a local bird tour leader, your, your daily uh, way being just a regular bird tour leader. So they learned it for monetary reasons. Uh, but either way, uh, there's a growing interest and there's a greater growing interest amongst 
young people who do it not for monetary gain, but for a hobby, uh, particularly in the, in the capital of Lima, um, where other people, not me, have been doing courses, bird rallies, uh, promotion events, uh, doing, uh, you know, a Saturday morning walk in a local urban park, showing people birds and going further afield, organizing trips. So bird watching as a hobby is growing amongst young people in Peru, specifically in Lima and in Cusco. Well, that's very encouraging to hear, Barry. I think there was another question as well on the chat. Is that true, Gary? Gary's muted. Okay. Right. I'm not sure if that's mine as well. I mean, the, what the question was, I mean, you touched upon climate change, and you touched upon how you've seen glaciers disappear and uh, bare rock appear in this place. What's that, what's that, in summary, how is that affecting the bird populations, both in terms of um, the range of birds and the density? You know, there's a lot, a lot of focus in the UK and Europe about uh, threatened bird species and uh, what's likely to disappear, what's possibly likely to, to appear. How, how is that changing in Peru? Is it fairly const, constant or is it um, a moving feast? Uh, that's a complex question, but let me start by take, going back to the UK. Um, when I was a birder in the UK in the 70s, like all of us did in those days, you know, the, the holy grail was Norfolk, North Norfolk. That's where you went. That's where uh, birders wanted to go. So I remember birding in Norfolk and seeing loads of birds. And I remember moved to Peru and decided to stay here. There were no verbal communications. It was pre-internet, it was pre-cell phone. It was, there was one landline that went on a cable under the Atlantic to the United States and then from there to the UK and I had to queue up for like five hours to go and say hello to my mum. I was cut off from the whole world apart from a letter by a steamboat. So I never went back to the UK for almost 15 years. And when I did go back to the UK, um, I went to my old stomping ground in Norfolk. And there was one particular hedgerow in one particular place that I birded in my youth. And it used to be full in the autumn, full of white throats, lesser white throats, this, that, and the other, red star, da, da, da. And I walked down it and I couldn't believe the lack of birds and the number of wood pigeons. The whole bird community completely changed. There was, and I thought, no, it must be the, must be the wrong day or, the winds are in the wrong direction. But I birded in the UK after a long time for several days. And, you know, if you live there constantly, perhaps you don't notice the drop because it's bit by bit. But after going back, you know, after a long absence, I noticed there were no birds. Now here in Peru, um, what I've noticed is there's one particular trail at a place called Manu Wildlife Center, which is large in the Manu National Park. Uh, where trumpeters can be seen on occasion. Um, there's one trail I've been walking for years, uh, say 20 years. And I'm not, when I walk that trail, particular length, it goes to a tapir mammal lick where you can see tapirs and spider monkeys and other things coming down for minerals. And on a walk, on a morning walk to that, that lick, I would see perhaps eight understory flocks, which might contain, you know, 15 species, and six canopy flocks that might contain up to 30 species. I walk that trail today and see it Now this is pristine rainforest. There's no mining close by. There's no major wood cutting. There's no, there's no real influence that I can perceive. So why is there that drop in the population? I don't know. This is a global thing that is happening. Obviously, um, we talk about the retreating of the glaciers. Um, we have one bird here, which is called a glacier finch. And why is it called a glacier finch? Because it only nests in glaciers. So as the glaciers retreat, the birds have to move higher. 
um, we're noticing here at extreme or high altitude is that birds that were limited to a certain altitude uh, are now nesting a little bit higher because it's warmer and the glaciers have retreated. We've noticed in the cloud forest that birds that were only at say uh, maximum 2000 meters are now being seen and breeding at 2200 meters. So yes, uh, climate change in Peru is affecting birds here, but it's not a unique thing. It might be more obvious here, or it, but it's, it, it, it's part of a worldwide phenomenon which I don't fully understand. Hmm. Very interesting. Very, thank you. Oh, uh, Barry, um, oh, just before you go into the vote of thanks. Um, a couple more questions, if that's OK. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Well, you go on for it, um, Gary, and then I'll I'll come in in a sec. Okay. Well, I was actually just going to qualify something that Martin said asked earlier. When I was there, I wasn't actually on a birding trip, but um, we had a guide to a guide for the trip, a Peruvian guy, and he was extremely knowledgeable of the birds and the wildlife and the plants, and let us know everything that was there. And even he even carried a camera around because he was. He told us he was making a film on the birds of Peru and he would disappear off for an hour while we were doing something else with his camera to go and try and catch them on film. I don't know whatever came of that, but but yeah, he was certainly very knowledgeable and he was a local Peruvian guy. And that. But yeah, so Victoria says, um, great. This is Victoria Merrill says, great to see your smiling face again, Barry. Thanks again for a brilliant couple of trips and many a more recent bird fair pint. Um, she was going to ask about the Tanager story, so thanks for that, and a very entertaining evening. And Fleury Burgess would like to know why you're in Spurn's bad books, if you want to answer. <laughs> you don't have to answer why, that one, Barry. What? Why, are you, why, are you in the, why are you in the bad books with the warden at Spurn back in the day? Ah, uh, well, he actually had the same uh, Christian name as me. And uh, he was uh, known to be a prickly character at the time. Um, but as a sort of young hippie student with long hair from Hull, he took an immediate dislike to me because of my appearance. And um, I saw him, uh, what do you call him, a uh, Hippolaeus warbler in the mouth of the Heligoland trap. And I wasn't staying at the observatory, I was a day visitor. And he you weren't supposed to go on their grounds. But this bird caught my attention and I moved a few feet off the road to get a closer look at it. And he came out and uh, shouted at me and banned me for, from Spurn for life. What? A bit harsh? Well, of course, I totally ignored it and went to Spurn, but I was quite careful about keeping away from him in the future. Mm. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you didn't suppress a Tang Mom's Albari. <laughs> no, I didn't. Mm. And I was there at the time. I wish I'd seen it. <laughs> Excellent. Steve, had you any more questions? No, no, my question was the Spurn one. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, Barry, it, it's um, my pleasurable duty to give you a vote of thanks on our behalf. And uh, as I indicated at the beginning, I thought it was very likely you'd transport us away from this uh, rather evil day here in Northwest Wales uh, to another land of sunshine and many, many birds. And you did just that. And it was brilliant. It was very vivid talk in the sense of taking us there with you and describing uh, not only what's there now, but what's been there and important to you in the past. And it's just fantastic to think that this young man from Staley Bridge morphed into um, a hippie student in Hull and then one of the leading field ornithologists in South America. Well done to you. That's a journey very few people will have ever taken. And it's a great credit to you because in the process of doing that, goodness, you've had to combat many challenges, whether they be physical ones like altitude sickness or mosquitoes um, or human ones such as terrorists and any one of those <clears throat> could have overcome most people but you've stuck at it you've built 
your knowledge and your reputation over many years to great effect. And it really came over uh, this evening with the ease with which you spoke about all of the birds, the fundamental knowledge that you have of them in the field and their relationships to other countries within South America. That all came through really clearly this evening and gave us a very full picture of what Peru has to offer. <clears throat> I'm essentially a botanist and Peru stands out floristically as one of the top five countries in the world for floristic diversity. So perhaps it's not surprising that it is so rich in birds and you amply describe them and the habitats that they occur in. But what a range from coast to desert to mountain top with uh, uh, tropical forest and tropical savanna thrown in for good measure. And in every one of those, what sparkling individual birds, so many of them endemic. I'm so glad you told us of some of the stories, both positive and negative about seeing them, the difficulties that truly exist in bird watching in such diverse terrain, making British bird watching look like a, a walk in the park by comparison. And thank you too for alluding to climate change. I'm afraid too often we think this is a problem for the temperate and polar regions, but clearly it's affecting all parts of the world and your observations clearly show that and are very pertinent and probably much rarer than the ones that we are often referred to in the media uh, and which affect the main centers of population. But it's the diversity of the world that really counts in all of this. And if the climate change is affecting the tropics, then we really need to know much more about it. And that can only be based on good baseline data, such as yourselves and other good field ornithologists can supply. You're a rare breed in that respect. And I hope that um, now and in the future, um, your knowledge and that which you pass on uh, will be valued ever more highly. Let's hope that Peru becomes a really good barometer in every sense in terms of knowledge and trends in the right direction in the future. And I hope that your tour leading, uh, your tour company helps in that process. Clearly tonight, there are several pieces in the, people in the audience who benefited directly from your skill and observation and friendly welcome uh, to Peru and its birds. I'm sure there'll be many others in the uh, audience who've not been yet, but would love to join uh, that select crowd uh, and meet you in your uh, adopted country. It's wonderful that you've taken the time to address us tonight from the high altitudes of Peru. It's just so exciting to hear from somebody directly there in contact with the place you're talking about. It makes it so makes so much difference. Thank you for your time, Barry, and for 40 years hard work and experience, which you condense for us this evening in a very entertaining way. Thank you on behalf of us all from a much colder, soggier North Wales. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.